Why does trade liberalization take place on a reciprocal basis? What does the question even mean? Suppose the US has certain trade barriers against imports from the rest of the world. Now persuaded by the argument of the economists that free trade is the way to go, suppose some US policymakers propose that the US reduce its trade barriers on its own without regard to what other countries do. Such a move would be called unilateral trade liberalization, one in which a country reduces its trade barriers without requiring that other countries do the same. Such trade liberalization is rare. Why? The import competing producers in the US will go all out against such a move, using all their lobbying and financial resources to exert pressure on the policymakers to resist making such a move. On the other hand, the consumers, who would be the main beneficiaries of such a move, would not be informed or organized enough to lobby in favor of such reduction of trade barriers. This is due to the existence of dispersed costs and rational ignorance that you learned about in previous videos. The most likely outcome will be that the opposition of the import competing producers will prevail on the policymakers and the liberalization proposal for the want of any vocal supporters will be quickly withdrawn to the detriment of the country's overall welfare. Successful trade liberalization more frequently takes the following form. A country from the rest of the world approaches the US and says, how about you reduce your trade barriers against our goods and in exchange we will reduce trade barriers against your goods. Such a move would be an example of reciprocal trade liberalization in which a country reduces its trade barriers to reciprocate a trading partner's reduction of its trade barriers. Such liberalization is more likely to be politically successful because even though the um, import competing producers are still going to be against it, the deal has now generated in favor of it a new informed and organized interest group, the American exporters. Because of the concentrated benefits they stand to gain if other countries reduce their trade barriers, the exporters are going to use their financial resources to lobby in favor of such a deal. The support of the exporters in favor of the deal is going to neutralize the opposition of the import competing producers and will make it likely that such a deal called the Free Trade Agreement or the FTA will be signed. The point here is that trade liberalization takes place on a reciprocal basis not because unilateral trade liberalization is not beneficial, but because liberalization is politically feasible only if done on a reciprocal basis. Now FTAs between two countries are called bilateral FTAs, but FTAs can be multilateral, that is, between more than two countries. In such FTAs, a country agrees to open up its markets to products from all countries that are signatories of the deal. The North American Free, Tra Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, signed in 1994 by the US, Canada, and Mexico is example of such FTA that is multilateral. Though the term Free Trade Agreement sounds like it completely eliminates trade barriers, in reality, FTAs only reduce trade barriers, and that too for only certain goods and services. By exactly how much are the trade barriers to be reduced by each country, and for what goods, is subject to intense negotiations before the agreement is signed. During negotiations, when a country agrees to reduce its trade barriers for a particular good by a particular amount, it is said to be making a concession. Each country attempts to get away with offering fewest concessions possible in return for extracting as many concessions as possible 
from other countries. The agreements that successfully come out from such negotiation are often hundreds of pages long because they specify in detail which trade barriers are being reduced by what country for what amount and what goods are excluded. Sometimes the proposed FTAs are ultimately not signed because the parties are not happy with the concessions made by its trading partners. Search the web for the Doha Development Round to learn about one such multilateral FTA whose negotiations have now dragged on for more than 10 years. The most famous multilateral FTA is probably the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, abbreviated as the GATT. GATT is the world's biggest FTA. It was initiated after World War II by world leaders who were chastened by the economic effects of the trade war that had come about in response to the Smoot-Hawley Act, an act of protectionism in the U.S. The countries felt that it was necessary to constrain, through agreements, the actions of major economies so that they would not be swayed by internal politics to impose high tariffs again. Only trade in manufactured goods was targeted for liberalization under the GATT. For several reasons, trade in agricultural commodities was excluded. GATT was in existence from 1945 to 1995, after which it turned into the World Trade Organization, abbreviated as the WTO. Though the agreement was initially between 23 countries, over time more countries saw the benefits of signing up for GATT and by 1995 a total of 123 countries had signed up. Developing countries who had signed up were given what is called special and differential treatment that required them to liberalize their trade at a slower pace and to a lower extent than the other countries. This special treatment was given to them because it was widely believed at that time that large-scale trade liberalization would harm the development prospects of these countries. That view is no longer widely held. Liberalization under GATT proceeded in spurts following each of the eight rounds. Rounds are a series of negotiations on a small set of issues that continue till each party is happy. The negotiators from each country then go back home and implement the agreed upon trade liberalization measures before coming back for another round of negotiations. Each of these eight rounds listed over here took place as part of GATT and were named after the place where the negotiations began or were named after a leader that played an important role. 